I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget J. Paul Valenza. I'm Thomas O'Neill White. I'm Angelie Preston. We need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is What's Next. A dedicated hour to have important conversations about the issues facing the marginalized and underrepresented communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We're going to have some real healing. We've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truth. What's Next continues our mission to discuss race, equity, and the common concerns of Buffalo's East Side and beyond. In the suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. And welcome to What's Next for the next hour. We're going to be speaking with uh, Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor, Jr., the director of the Center for Urban Studies, part of the UB School of Architecture and Planning. Dr. Taylor, always a pleasure to have you with us. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, we had uh, you on uh, not long ago uh, when you came back and reviewed to a certain extent because the report did come out in 2021, The Harder We Run, The State of Buffalo in 1990 and the Present. And that, of course, uh, detailed extensively about the, the conditions of uh, Buffalo's east side and what people, how people are, are living, what really has happened, how actually in many cases conditions have actually uh, decreased and deteriorated over two decades, three decades. Now, a new report from you. It's how we change the black east side. And I'm most certainly looking forward to getting into this. Uh, let's start with an overview from you. Um, you, you know the facts. You researched these extensively about the realities of Buffalo's East Side. What are the key facts? What are the key realities that play into the this framework for changing the East Side? Yeah, when, when we took a look at the history of, of Black Buffalo over the last uh, 30 years, uh, we wanted to know two things. Number one, what happened? What are the conditions that continuously breed uh, the challenges facing the African-American population? And secondly, uh, what, were, what were the cause of these issues and, and challenges? And thirdly, why had the intervention strategies that had been utilized in the past uh, failed? So we found that there were a series of root causes. Uh, and by root causes, we meant uh, causes of all of the other issues that black people face, causes uh, that triggered other problems and, and other difficulties. Uh, among these root causes were the residential segregation of blacks, not just the segregation of, of blacks, uh, but their containment in underdeveloped spaces where neighborhood and community wealth were continually extracted from the neighborhoods and the communities, and that they were constantly faced with displacement. A lot of this happens because they, blacks, do not own or control the land on which their communities are being built. But by wealth extraction, I'm, I'm talking about the charging of high rents right. uh, for substandard housing. I'm talking about the uh, uh, pandemic of foreclosures on these communities, uh, the high prices that are charged for shoddy goods, the high prices that people pay for house and automobile insurance. And I'm also talking about the extensive fines and fees that are rendered by the government uh, on the populations that exist in, 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 in these neighborhoods and communities. And so this is what we mean by the problem of, of wealth extraction or the problems of, of displacement reflected in how black people are continuously pushed out of neighborhoods the moment that speculators and landowners believe that they can make greater profits. So, for example, uh, many of the neighborhood, black neighborhoods along Buffalo's Main Street corridor are being emptied out. Uh, many of the neighborhoods that are clustered around downtown people are being pushed outside, out of those neighborhoods. And everywhere 
where communities are located around anchor institutions or other places that have the potentiality of being transformed from low profitability to high profitability, neighborhoods and communities are in trouble. So this is what we mean by, by this, this problem of wealth extraction and uh, the, the, the problems of uh, displacement, housing and, and the like. And these were the issues that African-American people were facing. And we said, well, why? Why is, is this the case? And we saw that this was very much related to the way we build cities in <laughs> Buffalo, that we set aside spaces where low-income populations and groups, and especially the African Americans, the, the Latinx and others, uh, live uh, so that they can live in these areas. And these marginalized, underdeveloped, and undervalued places are essential for the creation of high-value places like Clarence. Because, uh, just to uh, add to this, because we talked about this before we go on the air, that if there are places that are considered undesirable by the wealthier, more affluent populations, and there are places where they can go and be separate from that, that makes those places that much more valuable. It makes those places that much more valuable. I mean, if we, we look at the model of, of home ownership in the United States, uh, we, that model is based on the commodification of shelter, turning shelter in, into something that you buy and, and sell. And the use of the home, owner-occupied home, as an instrument of, of wealth production, that model requires policies of exclusion where you design projects, programs, and activities to keep out people based on income and people based on, on, on race because of the linkage between income uh, and, and race and rising property values. Those are, are models of exclusion, models of exclusion. So what we have found in Buffalo is that the whiter and more exclusive a community is, values go up. The blacker and more inclusive a community is, values go down. So on the one hand, while we talk about and praise equity, diversity, and inclusion, hmm. in reality, we practice, we practice exclusion, homogeneity, and uh, anti-equitable activities. And just to clarify one key point here, because you, you, you talked about it, how the white middle-class individual is really pretty much trained that your house, your home, is going to be your source for wealth. This is that model. That model cannot work on Buffalo's east side. I mean, no, it, it can't work. It can't work there. And, and the reason it can't work there is because the value of, of those houses and the value of those units will never approximate the value of the other locations and places. Not only that, but e even if, if it could work for a handful of people. A handful, right. Even yeah. if it could work, it's an exclusion model. It's an exclusion model based on individual wealth. So we flip that model by talking about shared ownership and the building of community wealth. Because, and the, and the central idea is can we commodify shelter? And, and by that I mean to say the moment you commodify shelter, what you're saying in actuality that a certain segment of the population, a significant segment of the population, are forced to live in dilapidated and rundown housing. That's the reality. That's the reality. So we, we think we can alter and, and change that model. And this isn't to say that one is opposed to home ownership right. and individual wealth production. That's fine. But at the same time, what we are opposed to is the creation of neighborhoods and communities 
where people are forced to live in dilapidated and rundown housing. And that's what this particular model calls for. And I say it calls for that because everybody knows that under the present system of, of housing valor, valorization, the value of a house is not based upon the parcel, but based upon the neighborhood and the community. So you exclude people from the community in order to increase property values. What we're saying is let's create a very different model. And now instead of emphasizing individual ownership, we're emphasizing shared ownership so that the people who live inside those neighborhoods and communities control and own the land on which their community is, is, is built. And that we emphasize community wealth accumulation rather than individual wealth accumulation because community wealth accumulation allows us to generate wealth that can be utilized on behalf of the entire community. And, and by utilization on behalf of the entire community, I'm talking about the creation of surpluses that will allow us to reduce other levels of cost. Let me give you a concrete example. Please. We were talking the other day uh, with Pastor Pointer, who's heading up the, uh, uh, the food co-op that they're developing on the Buffalo's East Side. And one of the things that the pastor emphasized is that we will not, we will have investors, but we will not be paying dividends to these investors. Instead, we will use the surpluses to reduce the cost of food and raise the, 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 the uh, 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 income of the people who work in the store. In this way, you pass on the profits that are being produced to the consumers rather than, than uh, uh, people who have invested across the time. And those investors recoup by being able to purchase lower price goods and services in the store uh, that they have helped to build and create. So this is a, a classic example of how we use surplus community wealth in order to build stronger, better, and healthier neighborhoods and communities. And also, it's worthwhile as we say this, just to also make another clarification here, the affordable housing models that we're seeing uh, different developments being built in different parts of the city, including in the east side, that current affordable housing model as that stands is not does not work inside what you are talking about here. Right. The affordable housing model is, is very problematic as, as we use it. Uh, it's a model driven by the utilization of low-income tax credits, and it is supposed to be targeted for people at the uh, bottom of the income order, but the developers have learned how to circumvent that. And many of these houses, especially now, are being flooded on uh, Buffalo's east side, especially in the Broadway Fillmore area, which I believe, based on our research and analysis, is one of the prime targets of gentrification in the city of Buffalo. But many of these houses will cap rents at around 60% of the median household income which equates to people who are making forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, and it becomes very, very affordable for them. I know recently when we looked at uh, market rate housing for a one bedroom apartment uh, for 2023 it was around nine hundred and sixty four dollars a month, and people will say, "Wow, that that's really, really great." But when you run the numbers, you see problems. Uh, right. For a person to afford that, they got to be making about $3,600 a month or around $40,000 a year. Not bad, but about 54% of African Americans make less than $40,000 a year. Around 32 to 33% make less than $20,000 a year. So that's too high. So if it's going to be affordable for the, 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 the black and, and, and brown and immigrant populations, you got to do something like Elaine Brown did in, in Oakland, California. Build units where, that are catered to people making around 30% or less than the medium area uh, household income. 
So that's a part of the issue. The, the other part of the, 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 the issue is that many of the people who are advocating these units are seeing that as a solution to the severe housing problems faced by African Americans, and I would also say the Latinx and immigrant populations. But that's not the case. You've got to fix the housing that people are currently living in. You're not going to build so many affordable housing that one day you'll look up and all of these houses will be empty because people have moved. That's a fairy tale. Right. That's a fairy tale, something that Walt Disney ought to write mm -hmm. rather than urban planners. The, 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 the issue here then is fix these houses, raise the quality while simultaneously lowering the rent. And that's the challenge that, that, that we're facing. The final part of that is I call these houses a, a Trojan horse for gentrification because they will be pulling in large numbers of, of whites. I had a developer tell me, and this was an African-American developer, that he was building affordable housing around in the Broadway area specifically so that they could attract a significant number of whites along with blacks, a significant number of whites along with blacks. And I'm saying this is because these are the kinds of, of tactics and strategies that are being used to impact negatively on the African-American community on Buffalo's east side, rather than saying we have a serious problem, how can we solve it? We're talking with uh, Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor, Jr., the director for the, uh, of the Center of Urban Studies at the University of Buffalo. Their recent report is called How We Change the Black East Side. You did touch upon it when you uh, made the uh, anecdote about the uh, developer that I talked to, but you did mention how the Broadway Fillmore area in the city of Buffalo, it, from what you understand and from the inf information you're receiving, is the prime development for, or prime spot for what will become gentrification in the yeah. city of Buffalo. Can you share other pieces of information that uh, lead you to that conclusion? Yeah. One, one of the ironies is that this was also an area that is where economic hardship is, is at the highest levels. Uh, most of the east side neighborhoods uh, uh, that have the highest what we call hardship indexes are in or near the Broadway Fillmore area. Um, so there's a lot of hardship in that, that community, but it's also a community with vast levels of, of vacant land. It's near downtown Buffalo, and, and it is anchored by uh, a major uh, uh, site, and that would be uh, the, um, the, the, the central terminal. Right. So it has this m magnificent uh, artifact that, that can be used as a stimulus for housing and economic development, and its proximity to downtown makes it a prime target. So the mayor of Buffalo uh, instituted one of their redevelopment strategies in that area. I think that might have been the Adams Street Project mm. uh, somewhere near Genesee and, and Broadway, which is... A, essentially a homeowner model with the idea that you develop home ownership and that that will trigger other forms and other types of development. We see uh, uh, the flooding of that area with, uh, with these affordable apartment units. And we are also seeing property values increase in those locations as well as the percentage of whites and uh, uh, individuals with uh, uh, college degrees occurring in those locations and spaces. And so it's, that's the kind of data that triggers our belief that this is a major site of, of, of gentrification uh, in the city of Buffalo, although it is at its very nascent stages of, 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 of development. Just curious, because uh, we have there's a lot in this report, and obviously we only have so much time. But when, like you said, it's it's the, you see this coming. You see the 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 seeds being sown. 
they're being fertilized and uh, the, I, the gentrification will, will follow if this path is continued. What could be done to stop that right now and find a way to continue to move forward? Yes. Uh, following the, the, the release of The Harder We Run, uh, my team began to notice uh, significant levels of development occurring on the Buffalo's East side. Uh, based on our count, uh, which is uh, based on a report that was released by Business First, uh, you got something around 2 to $3 billion of projects that are either occurring or projects that are planned and hope to be implemented uh, sometime in, in, in the future. So we begin to think of what kind of model of neighborhood development could we create that would change the trajectory of development on Buffalo's east side. We believe that the existing model uh, that was being used was not one uh, that would lead to, to fruitful results for the African-American community. And based on our analysis of black communities all over the country, including places like Atlanta, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Maryland, we were convinced that these approaches would ultimately lead to the displacement of the African-American community. Um, so we, we took a step back and we tried to understand how the processes of building the city contributed to the underdevelopment of the African-American community. And we forged a strategy of developing what we call an alternative model that was based upon five principles. Uh, community control, shared ownership, cooperative economics, solidarity, and community wealth production, and community wealth production. That these five principles would anchor this process of, 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 of development. A, a central part of, of that was to confront the issue of how do we use the redevelopment and the transformation of a community to empower folks and to provide them the skills to earn a, better, earn a living within this metropolitan region. So we wanted to create a, a project where one, we integrated planning and implementation. In other words, rather than planning and then later on development, we were going to plan and develop at the same time. Most significantly, we were going to develop an innovative training program based on on-the-job training so that people would acquire the skills that would enable them to rebuild their neighborhoods and rebuild their lives simultaneously. Now, this idea and notion came from our observation that the East Side had been turned into a job market for white people. Mm. I want to repeat that, right. that the East Side had been turned into a job market for white people. So when we talk about the Kensington project. A billion dollar project. A billion dollar project. We raised the question, two questions. One was, why are white people in suburban communities celebrating, popping champagne and lighting up cigars? <laughs> then we raised the question, who will get those jobs? Who will get those contracts? And we concluded that the overwhelming majority of people getting those jobs and contracts were going to be white. Even Mayor Brown admitted that, which meant that Bill, 
that billion of dollars would flow through the east side like water through a sieve. Then we looked across the east side, even in the African-American Heritage Corridor. Most of the work, the physical work, was being done by white people. You walk down the east side streets and you see people fixing sidewalks and installing pipes or even cutting the grass on the vacant lots. They're mostly white folks, mostly white folks. So we said, why don't we train black people? And this is something, by the way, we've been talking about for decades. Sure. So it's not a new idea. But it's how you do it. Yeah. Train them while they're doing the work. And let's avoid the, 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 the kind of fiasco that the Northland Training Center has created. We're not going to give people a test to see if they can be tested. We give them the skills they need to do the work. You don't have to be a mathematician. You don't know math. We'll teach you the math that's required to do this job. You don't know how to read. We'll teach you to read what you need to read to do these jobs. Tailor skill development to the requirements of a job. So that requires a new type of job training program. But in this city and across the nation, we have people who can do that. So that's what we mean by a, a new model, a model that is based upon seriously making the decision and the choices. So with shared ownership, a lot of people say, shared ownership? What are you talking about? Cooperatives? What are you talking about? And we said, what is the most successful institution in the black community? The church. That's a co-op. I will repeat it. The church is a co-op. It's people pooling their resources and, and planning and developing based on unity around a singular goal. Why can't we upscale that model in a non-secular way? So that in, 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 a, in, in a secular way, so that we are now pooling our resources to buy property, pooling our resources to develop commercial establishment, building and developing co-ops. Co-ops can't work. Ask the people at Lexington Co-op. <laughs> right. Tell them it doesn't work. Dr. Taylor, we're going to take a short break. We want to get into some more about this and these solutions that have come up uh, as part of uh, how we can change the black east side. Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor, Jr., director of the Center for Urban Studies with us. We'll be back with more. This is What's Next on WBFO. Join WBFO every Saturday at 6 p.m. for an insightful and enlightening series of audio documentaries from our region that tackle topics such as the environment, health, the world of entertainment, and more. Listen to the WBFO DocuHour every Saturday at 6 p.m. right here on WBFO, your NPR station. Hey, football fans, check out the USA Wheelchair Football League Tournament presented by Buffalo Toronto Public Media. Cheer on our very own Buffalo Bills as they face off with the Patriots, the Cowboys, the Raiders, and the Browns. Dump it off. It's picked off! Head to the Buffalo Toronto Public Media YouTube channel to stream it now. You're listening to What's Next, our place to discuss the important issues of our communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We want to hear from you. Click on the Talk to Us option in the WBFO app, and we will work to get your questions or comments on the air. Do you have a story or concern that we should be addressing? Email us using what's next at wbfo.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. Welcome back to What's Next. Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor, Jr., Director of the Center for Urban Studies at the UB School of Architecture and Planning with us. Uh, their most recent report, How We Changed the Black East Side. Uh, very intrigued about how you utilized when you were talking about community ownership and making that part of the greater plan for uh, where people can live, how they can work, how they can make a living by going and talking about the church, which, of course, is a is, you know, the, the churches of the east side are the heart of the, of the community fabric for sure. Uh, 
At the same time, I'm just curious when, you know, because when you, were, you, you said, you know, can this be done? Can co-op work be done? I think of, and I'm just going to throw this example out there as a local example. India Walton became a, a very popular figure very quickly because she talked about a lot of these things. Maybe not to, to the same nuance that you have. But she was, you know, first, you know, well, you can talk about what, whatever happened with her campaign for the mayoral race. But even in the common council race, she was rejected. She was rejected. And a lot of the, you know, the terminology was socialism. You know, I mean, she was landslided out of the, out of the common council race. I, what I'm saying is the people who, who voted in that election were east side people, Maston district people. How do you take that argument, like you said, or that example? This is, this is the church. This is how your church works. This is what we're trying to do. How can that, how, how can that message overcome the labels that we've seen for someone like India uh, Walton? Uh, f- first, I want to say that, that your assessment of India Walton is, is just incorrect. I'm sorry. Uh, you say that she was landslided out of, of the, the councilmatic race. Well, you can't say a councilmatic race that, that attracts less than 2,000 voters is anything. It, there's another story, and, and, and that story is that, that East Siders, as well as many of the people in Buffalo, has lost faith. In, in the abilities of, of government to do anything. Certainly. Walton's race uh, was about taking government and transforming government into a very different type of, of, of animal. And I think that the, the run that she made in, in the, the general election for mayor represents the hope that, that people had a, of a better future. Certainly. A hope that, that extended a, across this area and this region. And so if you are not analyze the, the election return, the, the tide of, of Brown's victory w- was driven by a lot of money from, from developers, including Palladino, and from uh, high outturns of individuals. And she won in the mayoral election. She won the Maston District. Well, uh, she won yeah, the Maston District. From, 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 from those areas. Right. And I think that, that Brown's victory reinforced this sense of hopelessness among the masses of, of people. And we're not talking about seizing City Hall at this moment. No. What we're talking about is transforming a neighborhood and a community. And in the process of transforming this neighborhood and community, we recognize that black people have given up hope on on this government to do anything meaningful, that they've given up on many of these organizations and groups' abilities to change the realities. And they've given up because they've been lied to over and over and over again, they've been promised things that have never come true. So they're moving on with their lives, not caring about listening to lofty speeches and wonderful things that people say. That's where they are right now. So for this reason, once we identify the site of our demonstration project, the first thing we aim to do is unleash community organizers. Mm. Unleash community organizers. Unleash. Having people pay to go down on the ground and train, talking to people where they are, on the doorstep, in the bars, on the streets, trying to understand where they're coming from, trying to understand their hopes and their aspirations, and telling them the type of way we hope to transform and change the community. And when we say we, we're talking about the entire community. And we want to know, are you ready to fight for the kind of place that you want to live in? Because the time has come 
for development of neighborhoods to be taken away from the politicians and the developers and the financial institutions and given to the people and let the people work with the politicians, the developers, and the financial institutions to transform and change. And let the experts, folks like myself, become employees of the people and not of these other individuals. So this is a part of, of the kind of project that we're talking about, where we build enthusiasm from the ground up. This is the way it has always been done in, in the black community, and this is what we call retrofuturism, where we look to the past, we understand the lived experience of the past, and we use that and fuse it to our efforts to design projects, programs, and activities in the, the present, so that this will be a plan and a strategy that evolves from the people and goes back to the people and that will improve the people's lives. And so we'll build this in one neighborhood and community, upscale it to other neighborhoods and communities across the city. And I guarantee you, the moment that people are able to see with their own eyes and their own experiences, how their communities will be transformed. And there's an election. It won't be decided by a thousand people. It'll be decided by every resident of voting age in that neighborhood and community. The time has, is changing. It's changing. This is a new world that we're living in. And as a consequence of that, it demands a new approach to building neighborhoods. And ultimately, it will demand a new approach to building the city of Buffalo. In terms of roadblocks, you have an idea of how to do this. Are there currently zoning other regulations that stand in the way of what you're talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's that, a mountain. <laughs> wow, there's a there's a there's a a real mountain uh, of them. Okay, uh, that we're gonna have to we, we we're gonna have to alter. But we also know we have friends in City Hall, including Rashid Wyatt, and there will be others. So uh, our first task is to select a neighborhood. And we've joined forces with Back to Basics, the Buffalo Center for Health Equity, uh, the UB Community Health Equity Research Center, and the African American Health Equity Task Force to move toward this. And uh, Pastor James Giles and, and others are standing in, and Pastor George Nicholas are standing in the forefront of this effort and, and this activity. And we've received funding from the Mother uh, Cabrini Health Foundation to fund uh, the selection, neighborhood selection projects. So we, we, that we've got widespread support from what, what we're talking about. I'm just the academic tool Certainly. of a larger circle of, of individuals, just the mild-mannered professor serving the people. Uh, <laughs> mild-mannered. <laughs> That's all, just a mild-mannered professor. <laughs> well, let me take a time out. No, let me take a time out. We've got, we'll do one more time out, and then we'll come back with our uh, final 15 minutes or so with uh, Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor, Jr., as he said, the mild-mannered professor that he is, and also director of the Center of Urban Studies at UB School of Architecture and Planning. This is What's Next on WBFO. The PBS NewsHour, continuing nearly 50 years of unbiased reporting. The speech sets the foundation for Democrats as they push for voting rights. The protesters have not yet been moved, basically having their run of the place. Covering a broad range of stories. You've got less rain here now, too, right? And they're running out of water. What's it like on that stage? There's this magic. I'm Amna Nawaz. And I'm Jeff Bennett. Join us every weeknight on the PBS NewsHour. Listen weeknights at 8 on WBFO, your NPR station. Hey, is this thing on? Test, test, one, two. Sounds great. Let's go. The podcast world is overflowing with more than 750,000 podcasts to choose from. But for great local podcasts, you can now go to one place, the new Amplify BTPM Pods app. Here you can discover content produced in Western New York and Southern Ontario 
our own backyard. With a wide variety of genres to choose from, there is something for everyone. Listen to the best independently produced podcast in the region anywhere, anytime. Download the free Amplify BTPM Pods app wherever you get your apps and begin exploring your local podcast community now. You're listening to What's Next, our place to discuss the important issues of our communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We want to hear from you. Click on the Talk to Us option in the WBFO app, and we will work to get your questions or comments on the air. Do you have a story or concern that we should be addressing? Email us using what's next at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And welcome back to What's Next. Uh, hope you're enjoying our hour with Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor, Jr., the director of the Center of Urban Studies at the University of Buffalo. Uh, Dr. Taylor, y- your report, of course, is how we change the Black East Side. We've really only scratched the surface in some ways, and I apologize for maybe getting off on a tangent or two. Um, and we're not going to be able to cover all the points, but you, you've talked about community control via land trusts. We know about the, the Fruit Belt uh, uh, land trust. Is that the model, or does that model need to be modified uh, as we move forward, what you're talking about here? Uh, before I answer that question, before I forget, uh, let me stress that uh, we're going to hold a public symposium on how we change uh, the Black East Side on February the 26th between 6 and 8 o'clock at Jacobs School of, of Medicine uh, and, and, and Biomedical uh, information. Now, one of the reasons that we're holding uh, this at Jacobs okay. is that we want to emphasize the relationship between neighborhood development and health outcomes. So that if you want to change the health outcomes of the African American population, you must change uh, the, 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 the kind of neighborhoods and communities in which they live. Uh, the Community Land Trust is, is one of the models. I think there were problems from the very beginning in the design and the construction of the, of the, of the Fruit Belt Community Land Trust. And so we've learned from that particular experience. And, and, that, and so we, we plan to use the Land Trust as a way of moving property ownership from private and public control to social control. Right now, the the city of Buffalo has a land bank, but the purpose of that land bank is to move publicly owned property to privately owned hands. And so one of the ways that we can control uh, uh, market dynamics is through the control of ownership of the land via community land trust. And that means that the people who live in that community will own that land and they can lease it and they can use it for other means. But it will allow us to both reduce the cost of of the ownership of condominiums and other types of things. It will also allow us to acquire commercial properties that we can use for commercial and business uh, development. So the, the land trust is, is a critical aspect and a critical part of, of the abilities to, to uh, control development in a neighborhood. Also, the importance and the significance of, of the government willing to transfer ownership of the large swaths of, of, of vacant lots that it owns to a community land Trust. So we think that that's a, a one and, 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 and critical parts of, of the challenge that we face. The other thing that I wanted to say is that we recognize that the black community face multiple problems. Now, when we analyze these problems, they're not layered one on top of the other, but they're interrelated and interactive. And so we believe if you attack one problem, you begin to trigger solutions across the board. So we're talking about a handful of problems that generate all kinds of of issues. 
So many of behavior problems and other issues, for example, are caused by hardships, the lack of hope and possibility. Much of the, the violence in our neighborhoods and communities and crime in our neighborhoods and community are generated by young people without a sense of hope mm -hmm. and possibilities for the future. And, and, and let me say this. The criminals that exist in, in the black community are low-income guys. These are not big-time uh, kingpins. They're little low-income folks who have uh, uh, low-paid jobs with high risk. That's what a criminal is, that break into somebody's house. Mm -hmm. And so if we change that reality, we can attack those types of, of, of issues. So the assessment of the multitude of, of problems we face are interrelated and interlocked and stem from a sense of hopelessness and lack of a, of, of a future that will be better than, than the past that they've held. So based on our past experiences, we've seen what happens when hope is ignited. Look at the nation of Islam in its heyday. Its members were drawn from the street. The, the black liberation movement back in the day with the Panther Party and many other groups, their strength was drawn from, from that. When I was a kid and we had a chapter of the Black Workers Congress in Buffalo, we had members in every gang in the city of Buffalo working to transform them. So we know what the past have yielded. So how do we bring that in, into the future? So a lot of this centers around the development of the neighborhood. And, and because of this, we're going through an enormous effort to select the site for this demonstration project. How when you talk about a neighborhood, is it already a, a predetermined neighborhood? Uh, how, in terms of maybe boundaries, anything you want to dis uh, uh, describe what type of community or por portion of the community you're, 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 you're maybe focusing on here? Well, we, 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 we don't know yet. Okay. There is no pre-selected neighborhood. We're using the census tract as a surrogate for the neighborhood. And in using the census tract as a surrogate for the neighborhood, we're talking about over 32 neighborhoods. Mm. On, on Buffalo's okay. east side. So we've set up a process for, for doing this. Uh, we've put together a team of about 12 to 13 people uh, from across uh, the Buffalo's east side and the city uh, to help make this choice and decision. Uh, my team has developed a hardship index that's based on about eight different variables, including poverty, unemployment, uh, and the, the like. And on the basis of this index, uh, we've created, we've been able to rank order every neighborhood on, on Buffalo's east side. So we will probably select about the top five or six neighborhoods that appear on this index. And then we'll have a couple of at-large neighborhoods that we select. They may not have a high hardship index, but that other members feel might be key and critical. Once this six or seven neighborhoods are selected, our team will do deep dives into each of these neighborhoods. Uh, we'll hold focus groups uh, where we talk to the people. Uh, we'll, our team of organizers will do field observations. Uh, we'll look at the magnitude and levels of existing developments that are occurring in each of these tracks. We'll do a detailed demographic analysis and the like. And from these, we'll develop profiles on all neighborhoods. Then we'll have a panel of, of community residents from across the city, not across the city, across the east side, give us their ideas and thoughts about which team is, is the uh, site would be the best. And then on the basis of that, our admin team will make a final selection. We're looking at several variables that will guide that direction. Number one, the level of hardship that exists in the neighborhood. Number two, uh, where it's located, uh, particularly neighborhoods in or near 
uh, what we call the gentrification danger mm. zone okay. will have high priority. Those neighborhoods are, are important because we want to create a firewall between the gentrification areas and those uh, 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 less vulnerable neighborhoods on Buffalo Z side so that we can begin to develop an alternate model of development in those locations and places. Third is that we want to look at just the readiness of people to drive that change. Because when we say we, that's what we mean, we. Uh, we talk about these changes. That means that if there's a, a, a city hall meeting, we want to be able to bring five to 10,000 people into that hall so that the legislators and others will know that this is not just a handful of people, but these are the masses working on these particular types of, of changes. So the readiness of, of the neighborhood folks is an important consideration. Then finally, the level of internal organization within that community. Okay. How many block clubs, the, the level of informal organizations and groups, does it have a, a, a singular or a couple of highly developed community organizations that could serve as the lead organi uh, organizations uh, for our efforts? Uh, so those will be the four variables uh, that we're, we're looking at. So we're looking at about an eight or a nine month process okay. just to select the neighborhood uh, where we're working. Then we'll be in the process, we'll be uh, beginning to look for the resources to implement it. We're looking at a, a probably a budget of around a million dollars a year over a five year period, and that million dollars would be used to put together what we call the A team. Uh, consisting of planners and developers uh, uh, who will be working closely with us. We know that we're going to have to leverage millions upon millions of more dollars in order to actually do the work. But we think we can do that if we've got the appropriate type of A team um, in place. In all of that, and I know some of this is all just evolving, how critical for or how much of a, of a neighborhood are you going to be focusing on in terms of, or how much available current vacant land is there that is under city control? Is that going to be a key part of which neighborhoods you target? And for that matter, being able to wrestle that no, land that, away that, from that. that won't be a key part. Won't the be other on. variables will, will, be, others. will be that. But okay. it, it is my anticipation that whatever neighborhood we select, they're going to be a, a, a large amount of vacant land in, in that area. And one of our first negotiations with the city will center around uh, naming our team as the developer for that area and region and, and also be willing to cede the land to us. But that won't, we won't approach that until after we've built the, uh, uh, f moved through several steps. One step is to create a system of internal neighborhood governance uh, where we'll be pulling together a team of residents that will be the governing body uh, for, for that neighborhood. So uh, we're talking about a new system of governance for the, for the neighborhoods. We have to get that in place. We've got to get the community land trust in place. And then we've got to spend uh, quite a bit of time uh, talking with the residents, getting the residents on board, and shaping a vision for the, for the community. So there are several steps that, that we'll walk through uh, before we get to the point where, where we, we're ready to start talking to the city about the types of things that we want them to do. And I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. This first year of the project is centering around really building and developing the support inside of the neighborhood and the community, building and developing the governing structure and acquiring a, a, a community-wide vision of, of the type of, of neighborhood that we want. Earlier, when I talked about the five principles, I mentioned solidarity. Solidarity or, or unity is the number one objective that we have in this first phase. A community that is unified and solidified 
has the capacity to achieve all of its other goals and, and its, its direction. So building that level of, of solidarity and unity, establishing the governing structure uh, within the neighborhood and the community will be our first step. Once we achieve that level, then we'll, we'll be sitting down and, and talking with, with government. And I, I want to stress, we we're looking at building a partnership with government and a, a partnership with, with, the, with the development community and others. But this is a partnership between the social sector and we view the public sector and the private sector as separate from the social sector. And by social sector, we're talking about the people and the community-based levels of organization. And it's that partnership, it's that core that will drive you know, uh, the other elements. But because we have to change so many laws and alter so many different policies, we will need that partnership with government. I hope to close you there. Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor, our guest on What's Next. This is WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOLN Oldean, and WUBJ Jamestown, your NPR station.